Our next speaker is Subir, who will talk about the fate of SYK type strange metals at low temperatures. Okay, so it's a point. You'll put the big one away. Oh, it's here. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Luca. It's great to be here and uh, really enjoying this conference and uh, with all the other great discussions. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday, but I did see quite a few of the talks <coughs> that, I, that worked very well. All right, so what do I mean by SYK type strange metal? Uh, so here's an attempted definition for the, at least for the purpose of this talk. So it's a metal with spatially random interactions uh, in which there are essentially no quasi-particle excitations uh, and in which the disorder self-averages that you you know, sometimes we think when disorder becomes strong, it leads to localization and metal insular transitions and all of that. But here the idea is that uh, uh, the absence of quasi-particles, the strong interactions between the excitations, i.e. the incoherence, uh, really prevents localization, and so things start to self-average. All right. Uh, but the purpose of this talk is to now uh, examine a little more carefully you know, when would this break down? At low enough temperatures, we do expect uh, this to break down. Uh, and the breakdown comes not from localization of the electrons, uh, but by other mechanisms, which I'm going to describe. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, begin by talking about infinite range models that we've studied for quite a long time, uh, which are fairly well understood. Uh, and there, too, for the SU2 group, uh, if you take TJ or realistic models, not the final SYK models in which uh, you have fermions with random interactions and no hopping. But if you take more realistic models for condensed matter, uh, then there are also, again, some sort of instabilities at low enough temperatures. Uh, then I'll go to this uh, Yukawa SYK model in uh, two dimensions, which is the model which we proposed recently with Avishkar and uh, Haryu and, and Ilya as a universal theory of strange metals. Um, I'll review that theory. Uh, it's also sort of a self-averaging theory. And uh, you're going to hear much more about it tomorrow from Avishkar and Peter. Uh, so this, so the, this part of my talk will be kind of an introduction to many of the things that they're going to talk about. Um, and the, the relatively new work that I want to introduce and uh, set up uh, some of the results you'll see tomorrow uh, is that at low enough temperature, even this model has a certain instability, which has in fact been known for quite a while, and I'll show the references, uh, that the random mass disorder actually becomes quite important. Uh, and this leads to a mapping to the random transverse field Ising model. This is an insulating model, but remarkably, it describes certain aspects of the physics of what happens to low temperatures to these Yukawa SYK type models. So the randomness is only in the transverse field? Or? Just wait, just wait. I will show you. <laughs> All right, you will. You. Okay. Uh, and, and you'll hear much more about results on this mapping also tomorrow. Okay, so let me begin uh, by things that are now fairly well understood by infinite range models. So the original model that uh, I proposed with Jinwoo in 1993 <coughs> It's just a Heisenberg spin model, uh, now written in quantum computing notation, uh, with, with random <laughs> couplings J, I, J. Uh, you know, they're building this stuff, so we hope. <laughs> they can still call it sigma. You know? What? Sorry? <laughs> they can still call it sigma. Uh, yeah, well, anyway. This is all they'll build. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> so take random J, I, J. Uh, so what we know is that this model has a function of temperature for SU2. Um, has the following behavior. There is a spin class phase at low temperatures, uh, so the Edwards Anderson order parameter is non zero. Uh, but the spin class transition temperature is relatively small, and if you generalize the uh, uh, symmetry to SUM, uh, then it can make it even exponentially small. Uh, so then there is a window of temperatures between this T spin glass and J. And even for m equals 2, this exponential uh, e to the minus square root of 2 pi is 0.08. Uh, it's fairly small, so there is a window here uh, where you don't get spin glass order. And uh, I'll show you some numerical evidence that it's actually well described by the m equals infinity theory, uh, where one way you can understand it is that the spin operators fractionalize uh, into spin-ons. Uh, and, and, you know... If you describe by the spin on by the SYK model, which I won't talk about, uh, you'll get the same, get the same sort of solution. 
Okay. Uh, so the way this works is you uh, average over disorder and you look at the uh, side point equations, uh, and these are the equations uh, also allowing for if you didn't have the QAB, those are the original equation which are also obeyed exactly uh, by the by the SYK model in the large end limit. Uh, if you but this model here, which is the <coughs> Heisenberg model, has the possibility of spring glass order, and it gives you this extra term in blue, and you really have to go to order one over m. Uh, to really see that QAB at low enough temperatures is always non-zero. Uh, so you have to just add this extra term, uh, and then the solution of these equations pretty much describes a lot of numerical analysis. So I show here the exact diagonalization study by Henry Shackleton, student at Harvard. Uh, of, so in the green is the numerical diagonalization. Uh, the red is the large M theory with some rescaling of the axes. Uh, and what you find is that there's a big difference here. This little peak here is presumably due to the presence of spring glass order, but if you go to higher temperatures, uh, it's a pretty good fit to this uh, spin liquid type behavior. All right, so that's for the insulator, uh, but now let's dope it. So what's happened is that even in this system, uh, the self-averaging is kind of broken down uh, because the spin glass state is not self-averaging. It's, uh, you know, the spin... Uh, differs by order one and its expectation value between uh, different sites. Uh, so eventually it does break down. Okay, now let's take the uh, TJ model. Uh, again, random GIJ and now also fully random TIJ. So this model has been studied uh, very carefully in beautiful numerical work uh, using DMFT like equations uh, by Dimitrescu. Uh, Antoine and Olivier and others. Uh, and this is their phase diagram as a function of doping and temperature. So what you see here is the spin glass phase at low doping and low temperature. Uh, and then, you know, apparently a Fermi liquid phase at higher doping. But if you look at the finite temperature behavior, uh, so first of all, the coloring is the exponent of the spin correlation function. Uh, in a Fermi liquid, it should be true. <laughs> Uh, and in this SYK-like state, it should be 1, uh, and that seems to be pretty close to what you get right near the critical point between the spin glass and the Fermi liquid. I, I, I have a question. Yes. So, it's Sheraton Kirkpatrick, that's mean field of the Edwards Anderson model. Okay, the Sheraton Kirkpatrick model is the Ising case, which is classical. Uh, these are quantum Heisenberg spins. So. And the TIJs are not random? They are random. Okay. I just wondered, it doesn't, it, it, but it doesn't matter much actually. You just need some density of states of the Fermi honestly. You can also, yeah, anyway. Okay, this is the model that's been numerically. In fact, you can, what you can do is uh, you can map this model into a, uh, you can do it explicitly the averaging of disorder uh, with replicas, and then you can map it onto uh, a set of DMFT equations. Uh, this paper reports the solutions. Uh, in the replica diagonal sector, so it doesn't go into this phase. Uh, and there's another paper soon coming, which actually goes uh, deep into that phase too. So you can study everything. So, so how do you get it into that phase? Okay, that's not the purpose of my talk, but that's a forthcoming paper. Okay. <laughs> you have to do the replica symmetry breaking. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really what the nature of my question was. Yes, okay. Uh, also in this regime here, if you look at the transport, uh, this is some measure of resistivity that you can define in large dimensions, and you see that near the critical point, uh, it's pretty linear, <coughs> uh, but again, you know, uh, but it seems to be linear even away from the critical point, and eventually maybe T squared be a very low temperature. Now, so this is, you know, quite a uh, two to four numerical work, it took quite a lot of work, but in the large M limit, just like in the original SY model, uh, you can solve the same model. Uh, and there you find that you can actually suppress the spin glass at some critical temperature, uh, and above which you have a, a critical non-Fermi liquid metal. And there, and in this critical non-Fermi liquid metal, this exponent theta uh, does indeed uh, vary smoothly. And moreover, you get everywhere here, uh, due to a, a Schwarzian mechanism that was worked out by Hayu, 
uh, linear to resistivity generically. So there, you know, we're really using some of the recent uh, holographic connections uh, to black holes, which uh, taught us a lot about uh, the subleading temperature dependent corrections, even in the large end theory. Uh, that's just, so. So that's not going to be the mechanism of linear to resistivity in finite dimensions, but that's what seems to be there at infinite dimensions. In fact, one of the things <laughs> I'm sure some of you also noted, uh, there are many different ways of getting linear in TNs. Why there are so many different ways, I don't know. Uh, it really makes life difficult. <laughs> uh, but they all seem to, all the interesting things seem to give you linear in T from very different mechanisms. It's a large number of scientists working on the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Is this like one of the noise that many things give you that? Uh, yeah, it could be. I mean, this, so this mechanism is it's kind of, you know, this has to do with a certain, uh, uh, well, yeah, scaling dimensions of nearly conformal field theory. That is the thing that I'll talk about now uh, is special to two dimensions, and so it's quite different. <laughs> Why they're all the same, it's uh, our bad luck, I would say. <laughs> all right, so now let's take a more realistic uh, model in two dimensions. Uh, so here. Question. Are the TSJs yes. also infinite ranged? Yeah. In the model so far, yes, everything was infinite, everything is infinite. except the Hubbard interaction was local. Everything, the hopping and the exchange were infinite range, uh, but this constraint is local, so PJ model. So you have a semi-circular distribution in the individual phase? For, uh, yeah, in the Fermi, if, if in the Fermi liquid phase, uh, it, you know, but you don't really quite clearly see in the Fermi liquid phase here. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit, yeah, anyway, I think the large M theory seems to give some rationale for many of the observations. Although, again, maybe perhaps this, there's a little Fermi liquid here. We haven't seen it <laughs> in the large M theory. Okay, so let me get to something more realistic. Uh, so we call this theory in our recent work as a universal theory because it applies to many different mechanisms. So let me mention many different models. Uh, let me mention a couple. Uh, I mean, the, in the end, you find that once you put in disorder, many different universality class that look quite different, in the presence of disorder, there is kind of a super universality. They all flow to the same, the same basic behavior. So uh, disorder simplifies things quite a lot. Okay, so here's a, the type of model that uh, Synthil discussed uh, in related context. So here I'm asking for a change in the size of the Fermi surface. Uh, in a single land model. Now, it's, that's you know, relatively easy to do in a condo lattice model, uh, as Senthil discussed, but in a single band model that takes a little bit more work. Uh, and uh, Yahui Zhang came up with some very interesting ideas that allows us to describe uh, this transition. Uh, so at least write down a theory for it. Uh, so on the, on the left-hand side, you have uh, some kind of background spin liquid. And on the background of a spin liquid, there are mobile carriers. These are these electron-like objects in green. Uh, and so this gives you a small Fermi surface uh, of the doping density P plus a background spin liquid. Uh, and on this side, of course, you just have a Fermi liquid. So you can develop a theory of this. It's a rather complicated theory. But once you put in disorder and focus on the essential degrees of freedom, it's basically a theory with a, some kind of boson phi. Uh, which turns out to be Higgs boson, um, a couple to a Fermi surface. Uh, the other theory also has been discussed a lot. This is the more Ising pneumatic ordering, uh, where you have, again, a boson coupled to a Fermi surface. So let's just use the language of this because it's a little simpler. Uh, so in this language, uh, you know, we expect this quantum critical region, and we want to know what's going to happen here in the presence of disorder. Uh, so this, okay, sorry. So this is work with Avishkar, you and Ilya, uh, all of whom are here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, continuing to work on aspects of this. All right, so here's the basic model we have in mind. So you start with the Fermi surface with some dispersion, and then you put in disorder in just about everything. So in the theory of disordered metals, you put in a random potential V of R. So the blue is supposed to represent quenched random uh, variables that are not fluctuating in time. Uh, 
you can also put in a random master. So this shifts the position of the critical point uh, from different points in space. Um, and then the, the thing that SYK inspired is you put in this G prime term uh, where you have random interactions between the fermions and the both. Uh, now, in reality, if you have randomness in any one of them, it will generate all the others. Uh, so really, if you're actually solving the problem with the computer, you can put it anywhere and solve it. But if you're going to solve it in some approximation, uh, well, you better put it in the right places, right? Because you're not solving it exactly. So that's, and so, you know, so you're going to use some inspiration from models in infinite dimension to figure out, you know, what might be the right way to proceed. Yes. Um, so in the case where phi is a gauge field, so yeah. there's nothing fixed by gauge invariance. Oh, uh, no, phi is not a gauge field, it's the Higgs boson. It's, yeah. it's, it's the yeah. slate boson, yeah, phi, that's what it is. So there is that coupling, but you'd also have a coupling to the gauge field. And yeah, so we, that's not as important. It's not important. Yeah. Yeah. At least in this mechanism, near this Fermi volume changing condition, it doesn't play much of a role. So you don't need to project? Well, I mean, the gauge field is coupling to these, uh, to these ghost fermions, not to the electrons. So it's not mm -hmm. that important for transport. <laughs> So this is a single flavor, you don't have this Okay, there are multiple flavors, we will need that. For right, but just for simplicity, I have suppressed okay. all of that. But well, the Isingenmatic is a simple, simple flavor. All right, so everything in blue is assumed to have Gaussian random spatial variation. <coughs> so in our current work, we made a, a, an assumption uh, that you know, if, you, if you just examine all of this in some kind of RG way, you find that this is just way too strong and this destroys the whole theory, the random mass disorder. So we said, well, okay, maybe you can kind of gauge that away. And one way you could gauge that away is just rescale phi to make this spatially uniform. Now, if you rescale phi, it will induce some disorder there. Well, okay, you keep that. Uh, it will also induce some disorder in a grad phi squared term, which I haven't written down. Uh, but that, those are generally assumed to be irrelevant. So that's really the key assumption, uh, that you can gauge away the random mass term just by rescaling the phi. Uh, but then you must keep uh, G prime and V. And the hope is that this rescaling works, and you can treat the V and the G prime in some self-averaging way. So it does true provide that S is small compared to S, right? Because otherwise it's not positive. So we're talking about the bare coupling, yes. But we're going to fix that very soon. <laughs> that's, you know, so that's the assumption. And uh, it's an operating assumption for now. Uh, and then you go ahead and uh, solve this in some self-consistence SYK-like approximation. Uh, the way you did that by putting all kinds of indices on things and taking a larger limit, but you don't really have to bother with that um, just to solve the Miguel Lagasperg equations for this theory. So this is what they look like. Yeah. <coughs> why does it change the answer if you can just rescale it away? Sorry, why why does it change the answer? If you, if can. you can't. Yeah, I'll come to that. I, I mean, you said you can just rescale away this. Well, we're, it's an assumption. Okay. We're going to assume, assume that in our present, in the published paper, we assumed you can do this. This is discussed in the paper if you read through it all. Uh, but uh, we're going to test that further. Which yes, is we know actually it has to fail. Yeah. That is just equivalent with neglecting all the gradient terms. Yes, yeah, yeah. Disorder in the gradient terms. And I'm going to not neglect them today, but yes. <laughs> it's an icing pneumatic case, there'll be a random field coupling. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, we're ignoring that. <laughs> we have written papers on it, but we're yeah. Sean. But anyway, that's too strong. That just seems to, uh, right. So I don't think the Ising pneumatic really applies to the cube rates or anywhere, really. Anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, in, in the large end deformation that eventually you're going to use, uh, phi is going to be in the fundamental, right? Yeah, so let me not talk about large end. There are other issues that you've all pointed out. Yeah, so uh, but I was just uh, even in the n equals 1, there's an issue here. Yeah. Right, so I was just wondering if, um, if you treat randomness in the mass that is off diagonal in flavor, does that yeah. matter? Uh, we're not going to treat that. So okay. we're going to. Uh, I'm not going to do large end, as you'll see in a minute, but let me just motivate this as some kind of self-consistent Elias-Berg equations for this model. Okay, that's not the way he motivated in the paper, that's not how we came upon it, 
But that's now how I like to think about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then you get these uh, equations. These are Lea's yeah, like equations uh, with uh, extra terms from the disorder. Uh, you know, there's uh, nothing shocking about these equations, but they become much easier to solve uh, if you actually only keep the blue terms uh, and not the non-blue terms uh, in the self-energies. <laughs> Uh, because then everything is just a function of frequency. All the self energies are only frequency dependent, and so you can solve them. Uh, but we did go beyond, uh, uh, we did include the G terms at least perturbatively to see that, most importantly, uh, the effects of the G term cancel uh, in the transport. So let me summarize some of the results, which will be discussed in, I think, greater detail with additional point of Monte Carlo. Uh, studies you have an of this explicit model. Form for sigma. Sorry? You have an explicit form for sigma. Uh, I'm going to give you some result right here. Uh, well, okay, I'm writing in, in terms of Green's function, but yeah, there are. Sure. Yes? yes. And going back for the con slide, if you don't mind. Yeah, and you said when you keep blue terms, everything is local. Does it mean that sigma only now depends on omega? Yes, correct. Okay, so no can dip, no Sigma dip. and pi only depend on omega. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's the limit that we are now. You know, computing everything you can think of, and it's surprisingly powerful. <laughs> um, all right, so what do you get? Well, first of all, if you look at the self energy, uh, you get a marginal Fermi liquid self energy, omega log omega in two dimensions. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, and this marginal Fermi liquid self energy is here, it's represented by the inelastic scattering term, and it comes from two contributions. Uh, one is from the spatially uniform coupling, uh, and if it, that you know normally you say gives you omega to the two thirds. Uh, but when the friends are disordered, this elastic scattering disorder in the denominator, it's actually only omega. It's not omega to the two thirds. Uh, that, that that's something was already pointed out in Alperin and Reed when they were looking at the Fermi surface coupled to the H field. So there's a marginal Fermi liquid. This is the HLR term. And this is the term that comes from G prime, which is also a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, and correspondingly, there's some renormalization of the effective mass. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really not that shocking. But what makes this very interesting, I claim, is when you compute the conductivity, if you do transport, uh, then you find that this HLR term, this G squared term, just cancels out. That's because it's mostly forward scattering and it just doesn't appear uh, in the transport. However, the G prime does not, uh, and so, uh, you know, marginal Fermi liquid behavior in, in self-energy becomes marginal from uh, strange metal linear omega or linear T behavior in the transport only because of G prime, not because of G. So that's the main observation of our recent work. Okay, so now we can take this and try to compute all kinds of things. So the resistivity uh, will be V squared plus G prime squared temperature. Uh, the optical conductivity um, has a kind of a one omega, one over omega tail with scaling in the uh, uh, omega over T scaling in the imaginary part of the inverse conductivity, uh, sorry, the real part of the inverse conductivity. <coughs> uh, and uh, coincidentally, just about the same time, there was a paper by uh, Antoine George and, and Dirk Wanda Merrill re-examining cube rate data uh, and concluding uh, almost exactly the same thing uh, is obeyed by the data. Um, I've already mentioned marginal Fermi liquid behavior in the self-energy, which is uh, seen in some cases near optimal doping when photoemission, specific heat is T log T. Uh, and now we're computing many other things. I just flashed them. Uh, there's a paper already on the web with uh, work by How You Go and Davide Valentinis from uh, Karlsruhe uh, on cyclotron resonance and quantum oscillations. Uh, there's short noise suppression by Alex Nikolenko. That's also on the web. And there's ongoing work on magneto transport, uh, you know, H over T scaling and linear H magneto resistance and all of those things under certain regimes, I think, will be available in this model. And Davide uh, is working on that. Do you get any doping dependence? Sorry? Do you get any doping dependence? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, things, uh, you know, everything depends on doping here, but this is for the quantum critical point right now. This is, all these results are in the quantum critical fan. Yeah, but I mean, the result of the cell is, is a... Uh... Yeah, no, he has a, that's a, we don't get that. We don't get the uh, Dan de Sau's uh, frequency dependence. We don't get that. Yeah. Uh, for example, in spectral function, do only can T appear in the combination square root of omega square plus T square or something more complex than You mean here, but need to transport. <coughs> more spectral function. Spectral function of what? Here? Yeah. No, um, I, don't, I don't think that. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, so just making a list of projects and showing you pictures of uh, all the students who are working very hard. Uh, Chen Yuan Li has been uh, working with Ilya on spectral functions in the superconducting phase in this uh, G prime only model. All right, so hopefully all of these will be out, uh, you know, in maybe in a few months. Uh, all right, so let me now turn to the, I have 15 minutes left, is that right? Or half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I have 10 minutes, great. Uh, so now I want to talk about the, the very new work. It actually was inspired by the two-level system uh, work that uh, York talked about uh, uh, in Santa Barbara, actually, also. Uh, and then I started remembering some old things. Uh, so here... What, what we want to do uh, is to take this theory, which we, uh, you know, looks like is at least fairly successful at somewhat higher temperatures, and really ask what happens at very low temperatures. Uh, and as you'll see, we'll get some, uh, some physics similar to the two-level system, uh, but the whole density of the two-level system and everything is a prediction then of this theory without uh, any additional parameters. Okay, so that's the random mass disorder at quantum critical point. So, so like I said, we're going to gauge away. We, so far, we've been gauging in the, uh, the delta S of R, the random mass, uh, and then self-averaging. And this seems like it's reasonable as long as your bosonic eigenmodes, which are the eigenmodes of your boson propagator, the like fixed realization of disorder, say at zero <laughs> frequency, uh, if these are all extended. Uh, but when they start to localize, the bosonic eisenmode could localize, and there's, of course, the two-level systems, uh, then you can't do this because the gradient terms are much, important, much more important. Uh, so we want to keep that physics in and not do the self-averaging. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so the rare region fluctuation of the random mass could become important. And once you, know, once you have a small region uh, where delta S has even may become negative, <coughs> then you can't ignore the boson self-interaction or the system is just unstable. You have to put in the 5 fourth term in, in a much more serious way. Because that's what's going to stabilize it locally and prevent, you know, some, just a localized mode to just, a localized mode never makes the system unstable. It just becomes a small excitation. So that's what you have to keep in uh, in some sensible way. All right. So, so, however, we have learned from the previous work that the fermions really uh, don't change very much. I mean, they get, you get the uh, uh, mod omega damping in the bosons, whether the fermions are <coughs> liquid-like or whether they are uh, marginal fermi-liquid-like. So let's assume, uh, what I really meant to say, that, the, that the, the main role of the fermions, as far as the bosons are concerned, is to get you this Landau damping. So let's consider this model here now. We integrate out the fermions. Um, you have just some scalar field phi on a lattice. Um, you've got random masses, and you've got random GIJ. But you have to include the self-interaction of these uh, bosons now. Um, and uh, I'm going to consider the case where there's a continuous symmetry, so the Ising case is separate. Uh, but if they, you know, the O2 case and higher, uh, with the two-component order parameter, would be fine. So here's a well-defined field theory. It's a field theory with uh, spatial randomness, uh, which has short-range interactions and hopping in the spatial directions, and one over tau squared uh, hopping in the time direction. Okay. So this is a well-defined field theory. You can put it on a computer, and I think Peter is doing some of that right now. Uh, and it's much easier to solve. So we can. 
I think we can all agree on what this field theory is going to do at low temperatures in a time scale shorter than it's taken us to agree on what, what non-Fermi liquids are doing. Uh, this has a well-defined answer, which I'm sure we'll get very quickly out. In fact, there was a very nice answer proposed already uh, in this very nice paper by Hoyles Kutapaki and Thomas Voita. Uh, and also there were some initially earlier thoughts by Voita and York. Uh, who made the who took essentially this model? They studied this model, uh, and what they argued uh, that in the limit of strong disorder, that when this this, this JJ and SJ are strongly disordered, then the system basically maps to the random transesterilizing model. So, Eduardo, you can wake up now. This is the only moment I, I do so. <laughs> So there's random in the JIJ, and there's randomness uh, in, in the transverse field. Okay, so this model has some RG equations that were worked out by... Sorry, how you go there, you, you have something overdumped, and all of a sudden... Okay, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So if I start from this model, uh, Daniel Fisher got these RG equations. Right, yeah. 1D. Huh? In 1D. No, this is NED. In NED. He solved these equations in 1D. But this RG equation is valid in any D, okay. as long as you have strong disorder. Voita yeah. et al. started with this model, uh, and they computed its RG equations, and they found the same equation. You get exactly the same equations. Uh, all right, so that's what they showed here. Uh, and uh, so why does this happen? Uh, well, so the way you can understand this uh, is following. <coughs> Why is this insulating model uh, in the strong disorder limit the same as this metallic model? Uh, this metallic model has continuous symmetry, uh, O2 or higher. This insulating model has discrete symmetry. So the why one are they the same? Local in time, the other one is non local in time. Exactly, yes. yes. That's the meaning of me metallic and insulating. Right. That's what they would mean. So why are they the same? Well, if you take a, a rare region, uh, in this case, it's some two-level system. A two-level system in time uh, is like a classical Ising chain. Yes. So in the limit of low temperature, temperature meaning here in this time direction, a classical Ising chain we know has an exponentially large correlation that e to the 1 over t is Ising's original answer in his very first Ising paper. <laughs> on the other hand, here, uh, if I take a rare region, we just have phi fluctuating in time, uh, that has a 1 over tau squared interaction with continuous symmetry, O2 or higher. And that was a problem solved by Dyson uh, in 1969. And this one-dimensional classical OM model with a 1 over tau squared interaction uh, also has an exponentially long correlation. So both of them have exponentially rare, rare region with exponentially long correlation times. So that at least shows that in the strong disorder limit, they have the same physics. Great. Almost done. All right. So then I remembered another paper on which my name was. But I forgot about this one. <laughs> <laughs> this has been worked on by Adrian Del Maestro. Uh, what Adrian did is well, he just took this theory for a different motivation. Don't worry about it. The same theory that I wrote down uh, and solved it numerically in one dimension in a some kind of a self-consistent Hartree approximation. So here's the theory. Uh, and oh, so this is the Gaussian approximation. So we take this theory, exactly this theory. This has a phi to the fourth term. You just replace uh, this uh, nonlinear theory uh, with a Gaussian theory. Everything is phi squared now with a renormalized mass s. And what is the renormalized mass s? It's the bare mass plus u times the expectation value of phi squared. The very f simplest Hartree theory you can imagine. <laughs> So what Adrian did was solve these equations self-consistently in one dimension. So that's you know, numerically quite challenging. If to reach realization of disorder, you have to determine all the eigenmodes of this quadratic operator. Uh, and then you average, and so the, here the, uh, the dots are the, the symbols, are the numerical study of the solution of this equation for some so Ising spin correlation function. And the lines are the exact scaling functions obtained by Daniel Fisher 
of the 1D transesterilizing model. So, so what this shows that not just in the strong disorder limit, but even at the critical point, uh, these theories match. Uh, and this very simple, this is a this is however a much nicer way for our purposes to analyze the theory, because we can also solve this in higher temperatures, uh, where we can connect to the kind of uh, self-averaging theories I've just been talking about. All right, so you're going to hear more about the solution of these types of equations and the implications uh, tomorrow, so don't go away. <laughs> so our hope is, and uh, uh, you can judge for yourself how well the hope is realized, uh, that this physics of the transferalizing model um, is what's uh, responsible for this foot, the famous foot in the seal, for example. Uh, so this fan up here is really the extended bosonic modes with uh, self-averaging. Uh, and this foot is related to, you know, these two-level systems that we find, which, of course, is very similar in spirit to what you all uh, talked about. All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, in the first part of your talk, you had a formula uh, for, for, for the imaginary part of the self-energy. Which had a g squared over v squared plus g prime squared. Yeah. Is this only valid if v is much larger than g? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So your potential disorder is stronger than yeah, the we just take a, deterministic interaction. Yeah. We take a purely diffusive form. We don't have the Landau damping of the boson is not mod, mod omega over q. It's mod omega times over v. Right? If, if I may just continue. Now, suppose that G prime is absent. Yes. And you're saying that in this case, the conductivity is not affected by, uh, the, uh, by the interaction. Uh, at least because in this approximation. Omega squared. If you, if, how you know it's more? So ask, yeah, you can answer, please. Let's say DC. Yeah. So DC. in this approximation. Uh, Right. In, then, yes, okay. there is no... The so this is a non crossing approximation, right? Uh, I don't know, maybe how you can add most of well, What I'm asking is, do you also have Altruler R1? No. <laughs> I keep getting that question. Meaning that it's <laughs> of neglect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't call it Altruler or not because I don't have quasi party. I, don't, I just don't see that physics being relevant. Well, the way I would say it, maybe it's what you would call Alcho or no. It's certainly possible when you include some higher order graphs uh, that a combination of V and G will generate G prime. That's the way I would say it. Maybe, yes. 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 Okay. But it's uh, crossing between V and G. Yeah, that, uh, certainly, of course, it's not allowed. We haven't computed that. I think that's a very important thing to compute if you want to have a quantitative theory, you know. Ultimately, we want to compute what is this g prime square. Uh, you know, maybe you can have some estimate from experimental v and delta s, and how does that generate g prime? I think is a very important direction for research. Yeah. Okay. I have a comment and a question. In, on a sure and on a for whatever. Happens. Yes. <laughs> uh, so one way to test that is to look for the single particle density of states, not yeah. for the thermodynamic density of states. That is supposed to have a vanishing single, it's supposed to have a hole in the single particle density of states. Yeah. And that comes usually from energy renormalization in the traditional. That's, theory. that's in the deep in the Fermi liquid regime, yeah. Correct. But here I would expect because even if you go into the Fermi glass, there is something similar going on. Well, uh, in that case. I so mean, you, just, you can just compute the single particle density of states from this formula. And, and you get a suppression of density of states at the uh, Let's see, if you just do an integral over K. Yeah. Uh, you just get the density of state. There's no suppression. There's no suppression. Okay. In, that, in that sense, there is no Altschuler error. I, I definitely agree there's no Altschuler error. Okay. The, the question really is how important it is. Okay. Yeah. The actual question I wanted to know is that in Daniel Fisher's solution in one dimension, yeah. the, invariant the, invariant, the fixed point is characterized by a distribution, yes. which is scale invariant but has long tails. Yes. Okay, so what are the consequences of that here? So, so Daniel Fisher's solution was in 1D, yes. as was this solution in 1D, yes. and, and these lines here are highly non-trivial correlation scaling functions that are in Daniel's paper. It's e to the minus x over c with golden means and everything, right. and, and all of that works. 
So in 1D, as far as we can tell, so the it agrees perfectly with okay. Daniel's solution. Okay, in higher dimensions, Daniel never had anything like that. Yeah, in higher dimensions, there's been numerical work yeah. uh, by Lasik Motronik and uh, oh, that's right. Chris Lawman, I think, has done some. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, there are no analytical work results. But in 2D, uh, I think they both concluded that there is a strong disorder fixed point. And they also have long tails and all of that. Yeah, but there are no analytic results. I mean, it's similar to 1D, but it's much, uh, it's based well, on the question is, what are the consequences from a physical point of view for some of these methods? Okay, I think uh, Avishkar will talk about this tomorrow. Okay. This is ongoing work, and you. you'll hear about it from Avishkar. Okay. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Subir again. So now we have a short break, 15 minutes before the. So uh, let's hear.